Good evening, respectful ladies and gentlemen. I'm honored and privileged to moderate this seminar on the civil law effect on the Physics 2017 Red Book, which is provided by the Chartered Institute of Arbitrators, CIR Egypt branch. We are privileged to have very distinguished speakers in this seminar, so I believe it's going to be very interesting. I would like, to, I would like first to introduce our eminent speakers. I believe most of you know Dr. Ahmed Wabi, so I'll be very brief in my introduction. Dr. Wabi is the managing partner of Wabi, arbitration and contract administration firm. He's associate professor at Faculty of Engineering, Helwan University. Dr. Wadi is a FIDIC Interim Accredited Trainer. He holds a diploma in, ter in International Commercial Arbitration from CIR um, uh, London. He's a committee member of CIR Egypt branch. Dr. Wadi is a member of the CIR, the International Court of Arbitration, Arab Arbitration Group, ICC, and the International Council of Commercial Arbitration, ICCA. Thank you, Dr. Salwa, for the presentation. Thank you. Then we have Dr. Walid Enim. I believe he's also very well known to most of you. Dr. Enim is the contract director of Hill International Africa. He earned his PhD degree from the University of Salford, England. He completed his bachelor's and master's degrees in construction engineering from the American University in Cairo as well as a master's degree in law with specialization in construction law and arbitration from Robert Gordon University, Scotland. Dr. Nimr is also adjunct assistant professor at the American University in Cairo. He's the vice president and education and training officer of CIR Egypt branch. He is the president of AACE International Greater Cairo section. Dr. Nimr has more than 20 years of experience in construction contracts and claims management. Welcome, Dr. Nim. Thank you, Dr. Sir. Last, I would like to introduce myself. I'm Salwa Fauzi. I'll be moderating this webinar. I'm the Commercial Director, Contra Contracts and Procurement at the Swedish Industrial Development. I earned my PhD doctor degree in law from Université Paris Dauphine, Paris. I hold a master's degree in construction law and arbitration, LLM, from Robert Gordon University, UK and Bachelor of Science degree in Construction Engineering from the American University in Cairo. I'm a fellow of Chartered Institute of Arbitrators and committee member of CIR Egypt branch. And I'm author of the book, Practicing FIDIC in Civil Law Jurisdictions, Application of Time and Additional Payment Provisions. Before we start, I would like to introduce our new mentoring program established by the Egypt branch of, branch of the CIR as the first program initiated by CIR branch in the region. The mentoring program provides young CIR members interested in arbitration and ADR with the opportunity to learn from the experience of more senior members of CIR's community. The mentoring groups are formed of mentees assigned to a mentor, a senior arbitrator or ADR expert, and a mentor supporter, an established pr practitioner. The mentor and mentor supporter will be available to provide the mentees with career guidance and arbitration, ADR, practical knowledge. Each group works together for a one-year cycle. The potential activities in the program include workshops, video conferences, publishing articles, sharing information, and networking opportunities. For more information about the mentoring program, please follow CIR Egypt branch on LinkedIn or the details of the program will be announced. You will find a link to this page on the chat box in this webinar. Regarding today's webinar, we intend to have panel discussions with our speakers, followed by, discussion, by discussions and questions. I ask you please to post any questions to the Q&A section, not in the chat box. We will take questions from the Q&A section and will not be able to take questions from the comments on the Q&A or from the chatting box. We expect to have quite a large number of questions, so we might not be able to answer them all. So we open the voting in the Q&A section where you can upvote the questions you wish to receive answers there too, and the questions with the largest number of vote, votes will appear at the top. Now regarding our topic, although the FIDIC 
forms of contracts are devised for use anywhere, anywhere in the world, the FIDIC is originally based on legal concepts rooted in the common law system. The second edition of the FIDIC suite of contracts issued in December 2017 witnessed substantial changes and expansions from the first edition of the 1999. It is suggested that one of the factors affecting these substantial changes is the influence of the civil law jurisdiction on the FIDIC contract, which was initially drafted in a common law setting, as we just mentioned. Here in this webinar, we investigate this theory with references to the Egyptian civil law. Now we're going to have panel discussions with our speakers, followed by discussions and questions. In this webinar, we will have a number of poll questions, which we encourage you all to answer throughout the webinar. You can post your answers on the poll section. I will start with the first question. Are you familiar with the FIDIC 2017 Suite Edition? Okay, we'll stop the poll. Okay. It seems that 50% of the audience are familiar with the FIDIC 2017 Suite Edition and 50% are not familiar with it. Okay. We move to the second poll question. The second poll question. Did you use any of the FIDIC 2017 contracts in any projects? Could you please post to the poll? Okay, now we will end the poll. It seems that the majority haven't worked yet with the FIDIC 2017 contract in any projects. Okay. Okay, now I would like to ask Dr. Ahmed Waley, do you agree with me that FIDIC 2017 contract conditions are now giving more consideration to the applicable law of the contract in general? Uh, yes, Dr. Salwa, I definitely agree with you. Uh, this is actually manifested in uh, various uh, conditions of contract where the FIDIC has explicitly and expressly added uh, uh, the consideration to the local uh, law uh, uh, and embedded it in its articles. Uh, in fact, in addition to the four uh, main principles that we are going to cover uh, uh, in this webinar, which are the good faith, the force majeure and exceptional event, uh, the decennial liability and termination of clause, you can find, I, I, I'm posting here sample uh, clauses where you will find that the FIDIC has in fact added uh, uh, or, or uh, considered the, the local laws in its uh, drafting. For example, in subclause 11.10, uh, uh, the unfulfilled obligation, although this will be discussed in further detail by my colleague, Dr. Walid. Uh, however, this uh, subclause is discussing the uh, ability uh, or the, the entitlement of uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, um, uh, the expiry of the defects notification period uh, in two years, uh, it can be extended. Uh, uh, it cannot be extended unless uh, if it is uh, prohibited by law. So I think Dr. Walid will uh, discuss that in more details uh, in a few uh, minutes. Another uh, uh, sample is uh, close number 
uh, clearance of site. This same clause was in 1999, which gives the contract, uh, the employer, um, the right to sell any uh, of the contractors' um, uh, equipment and surplus materials and so on. If uh, the contractor does not clear the site at the end of uh, uh, the performance, um, uh, after receiving the performance certificate. However, in uh, 2017, the FIDIC has added. Uh, that the employer has the right to sell to the extent permitted by applicable laws. I'm not talking here about civil law or common law. I'm talking in general that the FEDIC is considering the applicable laws in uh, its 2017 edition. Uh, a third uh, uh, example that I'm going to present now is the termination of contractors for default. Again, this same clause uh, with the exact wording was in 1999. However, in, in 2017, uh, the drafters has added uh, uh, the, the, uh, the words between brackets to the extent permitted by applicable law. So uh, now uh, the contractor, if the contractor failed to pay, uh, to make a payment due to the employer, these, uh, the items, again, the contractor plans and equipment and so on, may be sold uh, by the employer uh, in order to recover this payment. However, to the extent permitted by applicable law. Another example will be the one regarding insurance, clause 19, and specifically 19.2.6. Uh, in this, uh, um, in this subclause, uh, the contractor shall provide all other insurances required by the law of uh, the country. So, in addition to any uh, requirement or any uh, uh, insurance requirement in the contract, the contractor has a duty to provide all insurances required by the law of the countries. Another, uh, the last two examples will, will be uh, regarding the dispute avoidance and adjudication uh, board clause. In 21.4.1, in reference of uh, a dispute to, uh, in, uh, to the DAB, the reference of a dispute to the DAB under this clause shall be deemed to interrupt the running of any applicable statute of limitation or prescription period unless prohibited by law. So this has to do definitely with, uh, as you know, in the Egyptian law, the Mudad al-Taqadum and so on. Uh, so this is also covered in the uh, 2017 uh, edition and the last example that I'm going to cover will be also in the dispute avoidance and adjudication board close. This is in uh, 21.7 uh, in, uh, in case of failure to comply with the DAB's decision, the arbitral tribunal shall have the power by way of summary or other expedited procedure to order whether by an interim or provisional measure or an award as may be appropriate under applicable law, the enforcement of that decision. So this is uh, another consideration of the applicable law uh, embedded in the FEDIC 2017 edition. Definitely, these are just samples that I would wanted to present at the beginning of the webinar. Uh, if we are going to discuss these clauses in detail, we will need maybe two more webinars. So uh, we uh, selected to focus on four main principles as we said. Uh, as, we, uh, as we said, the uh, uh, good faith, the force majeure, the senior liability, and the termination of contract. Thank you, Dr. Wally. Seems very interesting. The principle of good faith is key in most civil law jurisdictions. Dr. Wally, are there any considerations of good faith in the 2017 edition which were not in the 1999 edition? Uh, thank you, Dr. Salwa. Um, the brief answer to your question is uh, yes, definitely. Uh, in my opinion, there is a very strong uh, a good faith influence, if you, if you will, on this uh, 2017 contract. And of course, any discussion on good faith and the Egyptian civil code, we have to start with the main reference of good faith in the Egyptian civil code, which is Article 148, as shown here on the screen. And it's comprised of two sentences. Uh, the first one just says that the contract must be performed in accordance with its contents and 
in compliance with the requirements of good faith. Notice here the word must, so it's an obligation. Yagib and peace al-aqt, wifqan good faith. So it, with two things, con the contract, the content of the contract and good faith. Now, the second paragraph, as if uh, the first one is not vague enough, the, the issue of good faith, adds other components other than good faith. So the contract words in, its, in themselves are not sufficient, but there are other considerations that run alongside these words, which are al-qanun um, wal-urf wal-adala, law, usage, and equity. So this is in addition to good faith. So of course, uh, as, as we may, of course, I, anyone who reads this uh, will think, what, is, what exactly does good faith mean? What ex exactly does equity mean when we're like uh, administering a, a construction contract, for example? How does that affect the clear provisions of the contract, right? So I'm, I'm sure these, these questions, of course, also come to the mind of anyone who's operating under a common law jurisdiction, for example, because I'm sure a lot of uh, common law pr practitioners would say uh, this concept of good faith is nebulous, it's vague, it adds uncertainty to the contract. So to help us understand this, this, um, this concept, if we can think of examples. So for example, signs of good faith dealing, what are they? One sign is, for example, a person in the context of a construction contract is say if, if, we, if an employer issues an instruction for an additional work, for example, and the contractor is late in providing a notice uh, that this additional work will uh, have additional, result in additional uh, payment or time, but it's known that this, the nature of this additional work will definitely cost you any additional cost and, and may have a time impact. In that case, it's an act of good faith that the employer will forego this notice requirement from the contractor because it's well known that this, this instruction which the employer made or made the engineer uh, do is, uh, has this additional cost. The other example is, for example, if, the, if, the, if an employer, there's, a, there's an additional time and cost that is due to a certain instruction that is given by an engineer, for example, and the, the contractor knows that. But instead of waiting for some time, the right time to, for example, uh, raise this question where the employer cannot take any action, the, the, the contractor would be proactive and would actually ask the question as soon as the contractor discovers this, uh, that this instruction will result in additional time or money, just in good faith to save uh, the employer from uh, the burden of incurring additional unnecessary additional cost or time. Another proactive role by a contractor, which is also a sign of good faith, is if there's an error in the documents, there's a, say there's a design problem, there is some kind of an ambiguity, uh, the sooner, as soon as the contractor discovers this ambiguity, the contractor would uh, immediately uh, alert the employer, alert the, the uh, engineer, so that the adverse impacts, impacts of such ambiguity are recovered. Because as you know, when we solve problems as soon as they occur, then, then we can actually save on potential costs or time. Um, another uh, sign of good faith, which I believe is, is extremely rare in the industry as a whole, is say if the contractor submits an application for payment and there's an error in this payment, which should result in additional payment to the contractor. So the contractor underestimated something he made a wrong application in a formula, for example, or something that would give that contractor additional payment. The engineer, if the engineer discovers this error, the engineer should alert the contractor and should take that into account in the payment certificate so that this additional payment is made. That's a sign of good faith. Uh, finally, if uh, the employer has prior knowledge or the, the engineer has prior knowledge of something that can give rise to a claim to the contractor from, for example, uh, minutes of meeting or, or a verbal discussion, but then the contractor just failed to submit the notice on time, then it's a sign of good faith that, that we, we will forego this notice requirement because it's, it, we, the employer and the engineer had prior knowledge. So it, that, that really the, the whole purpose of the notice is, is to have this knowledge. So if the knowledge was there in the first place, then we should not uh, hang on to this notice requirement, for example. So these are just non-exhaustive non -exhaustive examples. Uh, we can go on and on of, of signs of good faith, but uh, of course, this is just to help us understand, comprehend what does the law mean by, um, you know, uh, good faith and equity and, you know, usage and all this stuff. So if we zoom in on these two, um, the contractor promptly notifies the employer of the potential additional time and cost for an instruction or 
because of an error in the documents, the contractor is here playing an, a proactive role. We can easily reverse this as well so that the engineer and the employer are proactively giving the contractor a heads up that, you know, I am going to um, do this in, in, in the near future, which may result in additional resources to you, may additional cost to you, be prepared. So that is uh, normally in construction contracts, and I think in the UK in several standard templates, it's called the early warning. And uh, in the FIDIC 2017 edition, we have this new clause, 8.4 advanced warning. So this is very, very um, important in my opinion, and it's a clearly a, a, a reflection of good faith into the contract. Because if, if you look at the opening statement, it says each party shall advise the other and the engineer and the engineer shall advise the parties. Now notice the word shall. It's not an obligation, it's not an option, it's not a sorry, it's not an option, it's an obligation. The, the both an, an obligation and not just on the employer or the contractor, on the, on the three parties, the, the employer, contractor, and the engineer, that they must uh, alert each other in advance of any known or probable future events or circumstances which may, and you have all these, these four items, notably of which is, is increasing the, the, the contract price or the time. Um, so it's not really an option anymore. This, the, this is, an, I, I, in my opinion, it's a good faith. Um, it's, it's, an actual, it's, a, it's an example of good faith, but it is a contractual obligation now. Um, the other big example, of course, we can't discuss uh, time bars and civil law without going to, uh, sorry, we can't discuss the FIDIC and, and the civil law without going to time bars. And as uh, most practitioners, if most of people are here in this webinar, if you have used the FIDIC 99, then you have most definitely come across this very famous, or shall I say infamous, uh, and, and specifically this paragraph about the, uh, if the contractor fails to submit a notice within 28 days and the contractor is deemed to have waived is right for additional time or money. So you, you, we're all familiar with this clause. So what happened in 2017? So in 2017, in the claims procedures, we don't have one time bar, we have two time bars actually. So let's look at, let's look at them. The first one is now clause 20.1 in 2017 is now 20.2.1, this notice of claim here. And you will notice the first thing is that there is no longer the contractor and the employer now is it's the um, claiming party and the other party. So there's, it's now the, the, the clause applies equally to, to both parties and the time bar applies equally to both parties. And, and the time bar that we have seen in 20.1 and 99 is in this paragraph right here shown on the screen. And basically it applies the time bar equally on the claiming party if that party does not uh, fulfill the 28 day uh, requirement in the contract. But then, so this is uh, time bar number one, we call that. Uh, then if we go to time bar number two, there's, as we, as we all know, that uh, the notice is followed by the detailed particulars, right? So in the FIDIC 2017, we have the term fully detailed claim. So that fully detailed claim has the detailed particulars. Um, within these detailed particulars, we have, we have like, we have a time limit for the submission of these detailed particulars, as you can see here in the screen from Plus 20.2.4, 84 days to submit these uh, detailed, this fully detailed claim. So what happens if a party does not submit within this 80, these 84 days? Um, you can see here that the, uh, from the red uh, text is that the, if this happens, then the statement under subparagraph B, which I'm gonna explain now, uh, then in that case, then the claim, the notice shall be no longer, it's not, shall not be considered valid. So if the contract, the, the whoever, the claiming party does not submit this subparagraph B requirement, which is basically the statement of a contractual and other legal basis of the claim. So as we all know, as part of the claim, there must be uh, the legal basis or the contractual basis of the claim. So if, uh, if the claiming party, for example, does not submit that. So there is no, you don't know what's the contractual or legal basis of the claim and the 84 period has lapsed. In that case, and, and, and in the same time, that party had submitted the notice on time. So in that case, that notice that was submitted on time is considered invalid anyway. It's not, it's not, it's not uh, as if it has not been submitted. And if this notice is invalid, then we all know that that means that the claim is invalid. 
So we have, now we have two time bars uh, in the claim procedures. Now, the next thing, the next step is, okay, we call this time bar number two. The next thing to note is that the engineer in the 2017 has, now the door is open to consider uh, a time, a, a, a claim that was, did not fulfill these, these time bars, these two that we've talked about, okay? That's, that's one important distinction than the FIDIC 99. So the, the engineer, this is, this is uh, shown by in clause 20.2.2, which talks about the uh, notice requirement that we have seen. You see this paragraph here, it mentions that if the claiming party uh, receives a notice from the engineer that you know, you've, you're late in your submission of the notice and therefore it's time barred, but then here, if that party has, um, says that all oh, there, there are circumstances which justify this late issuance of this notice, for example, then the, the engineer has to consider this in the, in the determination, okay? And that's why we're saying it opens the door to that. By the same token, uh, if the uh, claiming party uh, did not submit or was late in submitting the uh, statement or legal or contractual legal basis of the claim, then in that case, again, the claiming party will um, has the, the opportunity, the chance to justify why, why, this, why, of, why this late submission, why, uh, you know, why uh, he was late in, in submitting that in a fully detailed claim. And if that happens, then the engineer will take that into consideration and the determination. And this takes us to clause 20.2.5. And uh, he, here is where we're going, going to touch on the concept of good faith. So when the FIDIC 2017 mentions that the, the engineer will take that into consideration, of course, it's not bound to, um, to, to change his mind. He can apply the time bars. However, he will consider the, justification, the justifications that are made. And FIDIC lists three uh, possible considerations that the engineer should think about. They are not, they're not uh, ob obligatory on the engineer. However, it's interesting that the FIDIC, FIDIC contract um, mention um, list these three specific examples of what the engineer should consider and they are uh, as you can see here on the screen whether or to what extent the other party would be prejudiced by acceptance of the state submission the second one is in the case of the late notice for the claim uh, the engineer if there is will, will consider any evidence that suggests that uh, the other party had prior knowledge of the claim Okay, the event giving rise to the claim. Similarly, if the contractual or legal basis is late, then the engineer will consider any evidence that suggests uh, that there's a prior knowledge uh, of the other party of that contractual or legal base. So from those three, the ones that really uh, apply to good faith is, are those last two. And these are definitely good faith concepts. And if I take you back to the slide that uh, we were uh, discussing the signs of good faith, that would fall under this last example over here. Okay, so having prior knowledge of a claim, uh, that is definitely, uh, and taking that into consideration, that is definitely an act of good faith. So uh, that's, I think, a very uh, a, a, um, important example of good faith uh, in the FIDIC 2017 contracts. Now I've actually, uh, you know, uh, completed my discussion on good faith. However, uh, we cannot leave, because uh, since we are, already on the claims procedures of FIDIC 2017, there's an important uh, FIDIC law concept, Egyptian civil, uh, civil law concept that is actually uh, present in this claims procedures and um, that I wanted to highlight. That, that could, can be as well a fifth topic from the four topics that we're discussing uh, today. And this, if we go back to the slide in here about 20.2.5, we've touched on the last two. But what about the first one? If you read the first one, it says whether or to what extent the other party would be prejudiced by acceptance of the late submission. Now, th let's think about this a bit. What this is saying is that, say that the, 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 other, the claiming party, we can no longer say contractor anymore, the claiming party is late in the notice requirement. As we know from the 99 uh, contract, then the time bar applies immediately, right? So the, 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 claim, the contractor is time barred contractually. And also by the 2017, if the contractual legal base is late, then there's no notice submitted, therefore claim is invalid. So what this is saying, okay, put this aside now, put this, those contractual requirements aside and let's see how this late submission really affected or prejudiced this other party. Did it really affect them or not? So this really touches on the concept, it is suggested, it touches on the concept of harm 
in the uh, Egyptian civil code. So for example, um, if we see this article five in the Egyptian civil code, which is a mandatory article. So this talks about uh, the, ex the unlawful exercise of a right. And I'm sure this, uh, this article is also present in the civil code of the UAE in Qatar in a lot of, a lot of civil code jurisdictions in the MENA region. And so if you look at, it says the exercise of a right is considered unlawful in the following cases. If you look at the first case, if the sole aim therefore thereof is to harm another person, and then uh, B, if the benefit is, uh, it is desired to realize is out of proportion to the harm caused. So and in, in Arabic, it's the darar uh, repeatedly mentioned. So the, the emphasis here is on darar or the harm, okay? Or in other words, how it may have prejudiced a, a, cer a certain person. Article 224 talks about liquidated damages. And if you notice here that, of course, liquidated damages is not applicable to what we're discussing, the claims procedures, for example. However, what I'm focusing here is that first sentence, which says damages fixed by agreement, the ta'wid al not would not be due if the debtor, uh, the contractor in this case, establishes that the creditor, the employer, has not suffered any loss. So uh, if, if the, there's liquidated damages in the contract, but the, con the employer did not suffer any loss, was not prejudiced by this delay, then in that case, the damages would not be applied. So the relevance here is that uh, the FIDIC has moved from an automatic application of the time bar, if they say, for example, the 2080s are not fulfilled, to consideration of if there's any harm or prejudice to the other party. So that's a point that the engineer should consider in uh, the de determination. And uh, with that, I conclude this uh, that's part, portion of uh, good faith. Thank you very much. Thank you. This was very interesting because under the FIDIC 99, we were trying to work around the time bar provisions if the contractor fails to submit a notice of claim within the required time scale. In an attempt to do that, we used to resort to the concepts of good faith and to Article 5 of the Egyptian Civil Code. But it seems that the FIDIC 2017 made it much e easier for the contractor to do so. Let's take this poll question. Do you support FIDIC's inclusion of these good faith provisions in the 2017 edition? Okay. Sounds interesting that the majority support FIDIC's inclusion of these good faith provisions in the 2017 edition. It seems that we have uh, many contractors here, people working with contractors on the contractor side in this webinar. Okay. Okay, we'll take another poll question. There are those who think that the time bars under the FIDIC 2017 claims procedures are in, an improvement from the time bar in the FIDIC 99 edition, while there are those who disagree. Hence, this poll question attempts to get feedback as to whether these FIDIC editions are welcomed by the participants. It seems that the majority think that the time bars under the FIDIC 2017 claim procedures are an improvement from the time bar in the FIDIC 99 edition. Okay. Okay. Dr. Wayne, could you please touch upon force majeure and its relevance to the FIDIC 2017? Yes, thank you, Dr. Salwa. But actually, before talking about this concept, I would like to emphasize on the importance of the time bar provisions and the improvement in 2017, because actually in several arbitration proceedings, we witnessed that problem uh, when contractors submitted uh, their claims and engineers did not accept the claim or did not make a determination based on the elapse of the, the, the notice period 
However, uh, in arbitration, the employer is um, is faced with the good faith uh, um, a principle which led that uh, arbitrators will accept these claims. So this is now actually a very important improvement and I think this will give uh, the engineers uh, or will open uh, the doors uh, as Dr. Walid mentioned uh, for engineers in order to apply the good faith um, or Hosn uh, Naya concept in order to uh, accept uh, um, the, the, the contractor's claim uh, uh, on that basis. So I think this is a very important concept. Now I will start uh, the second concept that we will discuss today, which is the force majeure in 1999 and the exceptional events in 2017. And I think this is also uh, a very uh, hot topic these days because of the COVID-19. Uh, uh, and I hope that all participants are well and safe and that uh, everyone did not have any problem with the, this uh, pandemic. So, uh, as you all know, uh, before before talking about actually the FEDIC, uh, 1999 or uh, the force majeure or the 2017, I would like to present these concepts in the Egyptian uh, civil code. So, first I will start with the uh, uh, concept of exceptional events. In the Egyptian civil code, Al uh, Hawadis Nazariyat Al Zuruf Al Tara, Article 147. As we all know, this is a mandatory uh, rule. Al Aqd al Shari'at Al Mutaqadin, the contract makes the law of the parties. Uh, however, in the second paragraph, uh, there is uh, an exception uh, when, however, as a result of exceptional and unpredictable events of a general character, the performance of the contractual obligation without becoming impossible becomes excessively onerous. So it is not an impossible obligation. However, it becomes onerous in such way as to threaten the debtor uh, with an excessive loss. The judge may, according to the circumstances and after taking into consideration the interest of both parties, reduce to reasonable limits the obligation that has become excessive. So this is the article, uh, uh, article 147 of the Egyptian Civil Code that is present, uh, presenting the exceptional event or Nazarit al zuruf al tara And probably, as you all know, it is also uh, presented in Article 658 in uh, Aqd al-Muqawla, in the clauses of Aqd al-Muqawla, almost the same clause. Uh, this is a, a, a part of Sanhuri's uh, book, uh, Sanhuri, when he was explaining uh, uh, this principle, the principle of exceptional event, uh, one, of our, uh, one of the condition is that uh, the ex exceptional event should be uh, general and should be exceptional. And then uh, Sanhuri gave some examples such as uh, earthquake, uh, wars, um, and so on. And as you can see, what is underlined here, or yantashir. So he is referring to pandemic. Uh, definitely, these examples are not in the law. These are just uh, just some examples in El Sanhuri's book. So El Sanhuri has referred to uh, the wabe or the COVID or the any pandemic as uh, an exceptional event. So if we go back and analyze Article 147, we will find that uh, the law requires some conditions in order to apply this concept. The first one is that the uh, event uh, should be exceptional and general. So it should be hatsa istisna'iya and amma. It also uh, should be could not uh, or it could not have been expected. Lam yakun fil So it could not have been expected when entering into the contract. Uh, so these are two main conditions. And the third one is that the contractual obligation, although it is not impossible, but exhausting to the debtor and threaten him of exorbitant loss. So uh, this is the third uh, condition of to apply the Nazarite uh, Zuruf uh, al tara The consequence is that the judge may, after taking into consideration the circumstances, and weighing the interest of the two parties, 
will reduce the exhausting obligation to a reasonable margin. So this is the consequences in case an exceptional event will occur. Now let's go and see how the force majeure uh, clauses are uh, uh, presented in the Egyptian law. And as you know, or here I'm, I'm also uh, um, uh, presenting a part of Isanhuri's book. When he was explaining the exceptional event, he said that uh, the fourth condition, uh, as I said, and تجعل هذه الحوادث تنفيذ الالتزام مرهقا لا مستحيلا. So it, uh, the, the contractor obligation is uh, not impossible, but it is, uh, 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 it is difficult. Uh, and he said that here, uh, this is the difference between the exceptional event and the force majeure. So they are both uh, impossible to predict and it is impossible to prevent. However, the main difference is that in the force majeure, the contractor obligation will become impossible. However, in the exceptional event, the obligation will become onerous, as we said. So this is actually the main difference between a force majeure and an exceptional event, according to the Egyptian law. Again, if we analyze what Isanhuri said, we will find that the conditions to apply the force majeure clause is that the event is exceptional and general, exactly as the exceptional event. Uh, the force majeure could not have been expected uh, during uh, um, uh, uh, the, the tendering or during uh, signing the contract, exactly as the exceptional event. However, the main difference is in the contractual obligation, in the force majeure, it become, the contractual obligation becomes impossible to perform. However, in the exceptional event, the contractual obligation is not impossible to inform, but is onerous and will uh, 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 threaten the debtor uh, of uh, uh, excessive loss. So uh, if we go to the consequences of the force majeure, this is clear in Article 159 of the Egyptian Civil Code, uh, as it stipulates when an obligation arising out of a bilateral contract is extinguished by reason of impossibility of performance. Cor correlative obligations are also extinguished and the contract is rescinded ipso facto. So, al-aqd yufsakh min tilqa nafsu fi halat istihalat al-tanfiz. So, in case of a force majeure, according to the Egyptian civil law, the contractual obligations will become impossible to perform and the contract is rescinded ipso facto. So after presenting the Egyptian law uh, uh, concept and the difference between the force majeure and the exceptional event, let's go back to the FIDIC and uh, see what are the differences between the FIDIC 1999 and the 2017. In the FIDIC 1999, clause number 19 was covering the force majeure concept. And in 1991, the FIDIC was defining the force majeure uh, as an exceptional event or circumstance. And then it gave four different conditions. The first one, it is beyond the party's control. Such party could not reasonably have provided against before entering into the contract, which having arisen such party could not reasonably have avoided or overcome, and which is not substantially attributable to the other party. So this is exactly the same conditions as per uh, the Egyptian civil code. And uh, the last uh, paragraph says that force majeure, I'm sorry. Uh, sorry, there is something in my screen. Uh, may include uh, 
Dr. Walid, can you help me with that? Because I think I went. Uh... Yeah, the, the, the last sentence uh, says force majeure may include, but is not limited to exceptional events or circumstances of the kind listed below, so long as conditions A to D are satisfied. Oh, okay, yeah, thank you. Okay, so this is the force majeure clause uh, in 1999. And now uh, in the exceptional event in clause 18 in the 2017 uh, FIDIC, you will find that exceptional events means an event or circumstance which is beyond the party's control. The party could not reasonably have provided the aids before entering into the contract. Having arisen, such party could not reasonably have avoided or overcome and is not substantially attributable to the other party. So it is exactly the same uh, definition as the force majeure. And also the last sentence is also exactly the same. So the FEDIC has only changed the definition or the term force majeure to exceptional event. So the last, the last sentence also read as follows, an exceptional event may arise, but is not limited to any of the following event may comprise, but is not limited to any of the following events or circumstances, provided that conditions uh, one to four above are satisfied. So it is exactly the same definition as the force majeure uh, uh, of the 1999. Now, if we go to the notice, in the 1999, uh, the notice of force majeure, if a party is or will be prevented from performing any of its obligations under the contract by force majeure, then it shall give notice to the other party and so on. So the FEDIC is now saying that the performance is or will be prevented. The party uh, is or will be prevented from performing any of, of his obligation based on the force majeure. In 2017, again, it's exactly the same wording, the notice of an exceptional event, if a party is or will be prevented from performing any obligation. So it's exactly the same wording. However, it is very important to uh, uh, clarify why, uh, from my point of view, the FIDIC has changed the term from force majeure to exceptional event, because this is actually uh, the term uh, uh, used in the, the, the civil law jurisdiction. It's used in the Egyptian civil code and the UAE and Qatari and all uh, many of the Arabic countries. Uh, we are using the term exceptional event, which is, I believe, is more uh, uh, general. Uh, uh, and um, that's why the FEDIC has selected to also uh, use the terms that uh, the civil law uh, jurisdiction is using. So if we go to the components of the exceptional uh, event clause of the FEDIC 2017, we will find that the exceptional event is beyond party's control, is not subst substantially attributable to the other party, and could not reasonably have, uh, have uh, provided against before entering into the contract. Any party is or will be prevented from performing any of its obligation under the contract. According to the 2017 and according to the 1999 also, there is a duty to mitigate uh, on the, uh, the party who will uh, face uh, such exceptional event. And the consequences according to the 2017 uh, FIDIC is that the contractor, in case he suffers delay and or incurs cost by, reasoning, by reason of exceptional event, then uh, the contractor will be entitled to extension of time and will also be entitled to cost unless the uh, exceptional event is due to a natural catastrophic, such as an earthquake, volcano, and so on. Uh, also, each party will have an optional right to terminate the contract. However, uh, in case uh, this will, uh, this right will be in case of uh, the elapse of 84 days of continuous delay or the elapse of 140 days of non-continuous delay, but for the same event. Now, it is very important to uh, clarify that when the FedEx say prevented from uh, performing the obligation, this doesn't mean 
that this is a complete prevention or impossibility because if it is a complete prevention, then the, uh, the contractor or the party will not only suffer from delay and or cost and there will be no extension of time and cost. So the prevention is not a complete prevention. However, the FEDEC has also uh, covered the complete uh, prevention in clause 80.6, the release from performance under the law. According to this clause, any event arises outside the control of the parties, including an exceptional event. So this is a more uh, uh, general uh, subclause which cover any event, including the exceptional event uh, uh, mentioned in uh, uh, sub uh, clause 18.1 which makes it impossible. So here we are uh, covering the case of the impossibility, makes it impossible or unlawful for either party or both parties to fulfill their contractual obligations or under the law governing the contract. And here I added uh, the Egyptian Civil Code Article 159 because this is a manifestation of uh, 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 governing law if the governing law is the Egyptian code, uh, code that is uh, giving the uh, uh, contractor the right, as you will see, the parties shall be discharged from further performance. Uh, so this is, uh, as I said, a manifestation of the Egyptian Civil Code Article 159, which gives the parties the right in case of impossibility to execute or to perform the obligation uh, to uh, terminate the contract or that the parties will be discharged from further performance uh, so uh, this is also a very, uh, uh, the, the, this um, uh, uh, a revision or this amendment made in 2017 by adding uh, the statement under the law governing the contract is very important because it is also uh, considering the uh, civil law jurisdiction uh, in this uh, regard. Thank you, Dr. Salwa. Thank you, Dr. Wayne, for tackling this hot topic and clarifying why the FIDIC changed the term force majeure to exceptional event. Now we'll take uh, two phone questions. Do you think COVID-19 is a force majeure exceptional event under the FIDIC 1999-2017 contract? And do you think COVID-19 is an exceptional event force majeure under the Egyptian civil code? Okay, it seems that the majority believe that COVID-19 is a force majeure exceptional event under the FIDIC 1999-2017 contract. And again, the majority believe that COVID-19 is an exceptional event force majeure under the Egyptian civil code. Thank you. Okay, moving to Dr. Walid. Could you please touch upon the senior liability and its relevance to FIDIC 2017? Uh, thank you, Dr. Stoywa. Uh, before touching on that, I just wanted to uh, mention something about the uh, force majeure exceptional event that uh, Dr. Ahmed uh, just discussed. And on the poll question also that you had, I mean, uh, it's, a, it's an important distinction that the question is, did COVID-19 prevent performance? This is different than make it more difficult or making it have more time? So this is the key question here. So in terms of uh, FIDIC, did it prevent? I mean, if, you, if you're were taking on these uh, uh, safety measures and precautions and you're moving uh, slowly with the work, the lower productivity, that's not prevention. It did not stop, it's not pre did not prevent the work. Um, in the civil code, exceptional 
event, you, it, did it make the work more on, onerous? And this is some, something that can be يعني, uh, subject to discussion. Uh, another point that I wanted to raise, uh, as Dr. Ahmed explained, the, the, all the Philip did in, in the, from 99 to 2017 is they changed the term, terminology from, from uh, force majeure to exceptional event. And with that, it's almost tailored to the term that we are, we as in, in the MENA region, uh, civil uh, law jurisdictions, the term that we're used to. Actually, not just the MENA region. I mean, the concept of hardship is also in, in other um, civil law jurisdictions as well, European and so on and so forth. However, there's an important distinction, and this is, this is still a difference between the civil law and uh, FIDIC, which is in the exceptional event, the FIDIC still maintains in 2017 that it means when the work is prevented, it will, will be prevented. However, as Dr. Ahmed mentioned, uh, Dr. Asanhuri uh, uh, explained that the difference between exceptional event and force majeure is one force majeure makes the work impossible, whereas exceptional event makes it just onerous. So the distinction here is that in exceptional event, the FIDIC did not refer to the work being onerous. It still maintained that it's still pre prevention, which is, which is still, this is a, a, an important distinction between both the uh, still the, the civil the civil code and FIDIC. Now, of course, again, we cannot talk about the Egyptian civil code and the civil code of a lot of MENA region countries without talking about decennial liability. Okay, so the question here is, did the FIDIC take into account the decennial liability in any way, shape, or form? And the closest clause that we could find that, uh, that uh, touches on that, which uh, Dr. Ahmed briefly touched on uh, in the beginning of this presentation, is uh, Article 651 of the Egyptian Civil Code, which holds the architect and the contractor jointly and severally responsible, jointly and severally responsible for a period of 10 years if a partial or total collapse or demolition happens uh, So uh, you have the 10 year period here and you have this joint uh, responsibility. And um, so this is what the civil code mentions, which is of course uh, mentioned in a lot of other civil codes as well. And if you look at this clause, this is in, from the FIDIC 1999, you had this clause called uh, unfulfilled obligations. And if you read it, uh, it just mentions that after the performance certificate is issued, uh, each party shall remain liable for the fulfillment of any obligation which remains unperformed at that time. And for the purpose of determining this nature and the extent of the unperformed obligations, the contract shall be deemed to remain in force. The, the thing that is notable here is there's no time period at all. So it's like unfulfilled obligations to eternity. You know, so there's no, there's no time period until when uh, is it liable. Of course, one might say, well, the FIDIC in Clause 1.4 uh, says that the law to govern is, you know, the, that of the country. But uh, in 2017, they made it, uh, made it more, they have another paragraph added to 11.10, uh, this second paragraph. And it mentions here that in relation to plant, so plant is the uh, machinery or equipment and apparatus that is used, uh, the contractor shall not be liable for any defects or damage occurring more than two years after the expiry of the defects notification period. So you have the, the DNP and then you have two years. And with that, the FIDIC made um, a cap of the contractor's liability. Uh, so, uh, but then the notable thing here, it says, uh, except if prohibited by law. So it's almost like FIDIC is saying, okay, so, so we will seize the liability of the contractor after two years for plant, after the two years of the DNP. Uh, however, they realize, it seems like they realize that oh, but civil law jurisdictions have this 10 year period. So maybe we should insert this so that we're not conflicting the two years, it's not conflicting with the 10 year period, for example. And further proof of that, actually you can see it in the, in the, um, the guidance, the guidance for the pre preparation of the particular conditions in 2017, it has this, uh, these, um, this excerpt, and it, it mentions clearly that uh, it may be necessary to review the effect of this subclause in relation to the period of liability, which we believe uh, is the decennial liability that you're talking about, imposed by the applicable law. And then in particular, regarding that second paragraph that we had touched on, it says that it, uh, this subclause may require amending to take account of the applicable law. So again, this is, it's emphasizing here, and it's confirming that they have taken into account this decennial liability so that uh, you know, um, it doesn't, that two-year period that is sh shown in that clause 
does not conflict with the 10 year period that is uh, in the law. And uh, with that, uh, thank you very much. I've uh, completed this at uh, this point. Thank you, Dr. Wayne. Okay, so let's see the follow questions. Do you think that the unfulfilled provision in the FEDEX 2017 contract is sufficient to address the decennial liability in the Egyptian civil code? So just to clarify also by this question, is it, do you think that, that uh, FIDIC should have inserted more words, for example, to, to, to cater to the 10 year liability period, for example, or, is, or are those words, that, those, this paragraph that we've seen, is that enough, is that sufficient or not? Okay, it seems that 50%, exactly 50% agree or see, believe that the unfulfilled obligations are sufficient to address the senior liability, and 49% believe that they're not sufficient. Okay. Moving on to Dr. Wayne, could you please elaborate on the termination for default and its relevance to FedEx 2017? Uh, yes, thank you, Dr. Salwa. Again, The FEDEC once again has added a new subclause, the contract termination, uh, clause, subclause 1.16. Uh, in subclause 1.16, this is a totally new clause in 2017 that was not in uh, the FEDEC 1999. And uh, this clause uh, reads as follows, subject to any mandatory requirements under the governing law of the contract, termination of the contract under any subclause, so whether we are talking about termination for convenience, termination for default, any termination of these conditions shall require no action of whatsoever kind by either party other than as stated in the subclause. Uh, as you know that in the 1999 and in the 2017 uh, different termination for default clauses, it was written that, for example, uh, if the 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 uh, contractor is in default, then the employer uh, shall send a notice, for example, or uh, shall serve a notice and so on. But it uh, never mentioned that uh, we need to go to, uh, we, we need to serve a court uh, uh, summon or a court order. Uh, and as you uh, probably know that in Article 158, which is uh, covering the termination for default uh, uh, clause, Article is saying the parties may agree that in case of non-performance of the obligation flowing from the contract, the contract will be deemed to have been rescinded ipso facto without a court order. Such an agreement does not release the parties from the obligation of serving a formal summon unless parties expressly agree that such a summon will be dispensed with. So according to this article, uh, the... the uh, the party, in order to terminate the contract, he has to serve a formal summon, uh, so a formal uh, summon, and to get a court award, unless the parties agreed expressly in their contract that this is not required. So now the FEDEC has uh, expressly uh, 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 revised ha has revised its uh, uh, the, the 1999 by adding in the 2017. Uh, this uh, article uh, or this uh, uh, subclause to expressly say that the parties are not required to do anything except what is written in the termination uh, clauses. So now it is clear that the parties are not required to go to the court or to so to serve uh, a summons. So this will cover the 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 article or the requirement of the article 158. Great, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wadi, for this clarification. It seems that was not, uh, that there is a great transition in tackling the, especially that the termination clauses under the FIDIC 99, when interpreted in the context of the civil law, we had to make 
to make some amendments in the particular condition. Yeah. Okay, by this we conclude the panel discussions part. Sounds very good for food for thought regarding the influence of the civil law jurisdictions on the FIDIC 2017 edition. Now the floor is open for questions. We will take your questions from the Q&A section. I remind you that due to the expected large number of, or due to the large number of questions we have, we might not be able to answer them all. We've opened the voting and we will start by uh, the question with the largest numbers of votes, which will appear at the top. Okay. So we'll take the first question. Will you please share the presentation file at the end? I believe that the, we will share with you the presentation file. Okay. What is the difference between the force majeure in its effect and the frustration of the contract? Okay, I'll direct this question, Dr. Whaley. The difference between the force majeure and the frustration of contract. Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Salva. The frustration of contract is a common law concept, and uh, um, we cannot compare uh, the force majeure to the frustration. Frustration is similar to the exceptional event. The frustration uh, is uh, will make the contract uh, more onerous. It will uh, threaten the con the the contractor uh, or the employer. Uh, by uh, uh, excessive loss. Uh, however, uh, the, the, the obligation will not be impossible. So the force majeure will make the obligation impossible to perform. However, the frustration or the exceptional event will make it uh, uh, onerous to perform. So this is the main difference. So differ the difference is mainly in the, uh, the in this condition however they are uh, uh, both um, uh, unpredictable and exceptional and so on uh, i don't know if dr walid would like to comment also on this issue i i, I agree with you i have no further comments i do agree with you okay a question to dr walid sometimes the employer requests the contractor to proceed with change orders while the time and cost impact are still under negotiation. How could this situation be managed? And this may lead later to disputes if no agreement, or no agreement is reached. Uh, yes, well, this, I think this, uh, the, the, the uh, as soon as, uh, the, the key point here is if this uh, item, this change is agreed at least between the, the parties, the engineer and the contractor, that this in, in, in principle has merit. So if this has merit, it is a, it's an acknowledged change and the contractor proceeds with that change, then um, what we do in practice is we issue, uh, the engineer issues something called the change notice or a variation instruction to acknowledge that this is a variation. And, and in the same time, this is a, a, a cue for the contractor to submit in the first payment application and the next in voice to submit the, uh, these works uh, for payment and the engineer must yani must uh, at least process an on-account payment for this for this uh, amount so the engineer the contractor is working and is getting paid for this for this um, change uh, per the engineer's assessment and of course the engineer's assessment will be made uh, an accurate and can, can reach the agreement with the contractor uh, when proper substantiation or full substantiation, substantiation is provided. So it's, it would be good practice if the, if the contractor submits the detailed particulars of that uh, change as soon as possible. Because as you know, uh, in, com in practice what happens is the contractor submits a notice and the contractor then uh, submits detailed particulars uh, later on. Maybe the, the, the time is the one that takes, takes a long time, but, uh, but the cost should be submitted promptly and with, with enough supporting documents. But still, that does not mean that the that the engineer will require the contractor to to perform at, at no uh, with no payment. Of course, the, the contractor must be paid in the next invoice as long as it's something that is in principle accepted uh, according to at least the engineer's uh, assessment. Thank you, Doctor Walid. Doctor Salwa, may I also comment on this question, please? Yes, sure, please do. Okay, because I think this is a very important question and. Uh, um, sometimes the employer requests the contractor to proceed with the change order. Actually, 
since we are talking about the FedEx, the FedEx actually requires the contractor to proceed with the change order uh, before uh, uh, agreeing on a time and cost. So the contractor shall proceed uh, once he received the instruction. Uh, however, I'm sure that, uh, or I know that uh, many of the contractors, especially in Egypt, when uh, working in, in public works, uh, they are used uh, to the fact that they will not start working on any change order before uh, reaching an agreement with the, the employer on the time and on the cost. And they believe that uh, the FedEx in this, uh, in this um, issue is, uh, is, uh, is not fair because they believe that uh, uh, the employer has the upper hand because the contractor will start working and then uh, at the end, the employer will uh, have the upper hand and will be able to negotiate uh, 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 the time and cost. However, uh, I would like each contractor or each uh, participants who are thinking like that to, uh, to put it the other way around. What if the employer, whenever he would like to make any changes to his project, he has to wait until the contractor agree or give him an offer and they reach an agreement on the cost and the time of this variation? Who will have the upper hand in this case? And it's very important, as Dr. Walid said uh, in his answer, that we have to know that the engineer is the one who will make the determination and the engineer is the fair party. In, in, in this issue, he is uh, the fair party and uh, his determination will be uh, fair. So uh, I think that uh, we, should all, uh, we should all agree that this is the right procedure, that the contractor has to proceed and then the engineer will make a fair determination. Thank you, Dr. Sal. Thank you, Dr. Wade. Okay, so this question, the question uh, related to force majeure, so I will direct it to Dr. Wade as well. Uh, and I think we have a number of questions related to, force, to, to COVID-19 and force majeure. First, we'll start with this one, not related to COVID-19, but generally to the exceptional events. I think in 2017, uh, after changing the wording to be exceptional events, it still differs from um, the term under the Egyptian civil code because one of the conditions of considering the event to be an excep excep exceptional event, I believe this is meant to be under the FIDIC, is to prevent the contractual obligation, which is the definition of force majeure in, under the Egyptian civil code, not the ex exceptional event. Am I right? No, uh, okay, I think that that's why I said in my in, in my presentation that by the word prevent, it doesn't mean a complete uh, prevention or uh, impossibility to perform. When uh, you are prevented to complete your project on time, you will still be able to complete your project, but you are prevented from completing the project as per the time for completion. So that's a prevention. When you are prevented to execute the work according to the estimated cost, that's a prevention. That doesn't mean that you are uh, uh, prevented from performing the complete project and consequently uh, the project should be uh, terminated. So uh, that's why I believe the word prevention should be uh, correctly interpreted. It's not a complete prevention. It is just the 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 suffer that's why the 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 the, the consequences is uh, the contractor suffering uh, uh, a delay or cost so it is not that the contractor is suffering uh, an impossibility to uh, complete the project and that's why in in sub uh, clause 18.6 uh, the pedic is uh, covering the part of impossibility which is uh, the force majeure as per the egyptian civil code Thank you, Dr. Wei. A relevant question as well. Is a virus of corona typical of the law of the law? Is it a virus of corona typical of the law of the law? Is the COVID-19 considered um, exceptional event, not force majeure event under the Egyptian civil code? Okay, my answer to this question is uh, a question. Do you think that you uh, cannot perform your obligation. If you cannot perform your obligation, then this is a force majeure and the contract will be uh, rescinded or terminated ipso facto. If you believe that 
your obligation has become more onerous, then this is an exceptional event. And in this case, uh, you should be compensated uh, to an extent. I will also answer in Arabic. أنا في رأيي الرد على السؤال ده هيبقى بسؤال تاني لو حضرتك شايف إن الكورونا أو كوفيد 19 منعت حضرتك من تنفيذ التزامك بقى في استحالة في تنفيذ التزامك يبقى ده قوة قهرة وبالتالي النتيجة هتكون فسخ إن العقد هينفسخ من تلقاء نفسه أما في حالة إن الكورونا أدت إلى مش استحالة تنفيذ ولكن الالتزام أصبح مرهق عليك فده معناه أن دي ظروف طرقة ودي حادثة استثنائية وفي الحالة دي المقاول هيتعوض وفقا لنظرية الظروف الطرقة وبالتالي أنا رأيي أنه لغاية النهاردة الحمد لله إحنا شغالين يمكن في صعوبة في الشغل ولكن المشاريع شغالة وبالتالي وجهة نظري أن هي طبعا ظرف طارئ وليست قوة قهرة حتى الآن ولكن الله أعلم هيحصل إيه بكرة I want to, if I may, just add something uh, I'll also uh, add it in Arabic uh, uh, دكتور أحمد mentioned uh, قال أن هيكون هيتم تعويض المقاول وفقا لنظرية الظروف الطارئة وفقا لقانون المدني لكن let's remember خلينا نفتكر ان الوفق عن القانون المدني does not say ان المقاول هيتعوض uh, it says ان القاضي هيعيد ممكن التوازن الاقتصادي يعني ده خلوا بالكم ان ال employers برضو اتضروا من الموضوع ده يعني ال employers برضو suffered losses وخلوا بالكم برضو ان النظرية دي uh, it's not talking about any loss بتتكلم على خسارة uh, يعني جسيمة حاجة حاجة really uh, exorbitant طبعا الحاجه الديبيتبل في موضوع النظريه دي في القانون وات از اكزوربتنت يعني لو واحد مقاول مثلا يعني نو no بروفيت ده مش اكزوربتنت خالص ده اسمها بريك ايفن لو واحد خسر بس 5% مثلا 10% هل ده اكزوربتنت؟ ده برضه ده سؤال 20 30 ميبي اه بس يعني فتطبيق النظريه دي قانونا مش يعني مش حاجه برضه يعني فيها فيها a lot of proof يعني برضه حاجه مش 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 سهله especially في موضوع كوفيد 19 برضه بالذات ان زي ما الدكتور احمد قال الشغل شغال مش بقى يعني في شغال جنرالي حوالين العالم يمكن at a slower pace يمكن حصل شويه suspensions because of this is this is بقى لا فورس ماجور ولا exceptional event الحاجه اللي more relevant موضوع change of laws مثلا القوانين مثلا بتعمل لوك داون في قوانين منزمه لازم ما فيش شغل هنا الكليم بيتعمل على على 13.7 مثلا في 99 مش على الفورس ماجور اكسبشن ايفنت بس حبيت اوضح بس شكرا طيب انا عايزه اعقب بس يعني يعني تكييف تاثير فيروس الكورونا طبقا للقانون المصري لازم يدرس كل حاله بعينها يعني ات شود بي ستاديد اون كيس باي كيس بيسز ذير از نو وان انسر ذات فيتس اول كيسز بس جنرالي سبيكينج زي ما قلنا ان هو غالبا مش هتبقى قوه قهره في معظم الحالات. اوكي ومش شرط ان احنا نفيزت بس القوه القهره والاكسبشنال ايفنتس يعني في اذر كلوزز ان ذا كونتراكت ذات مايت مايت بي تاكلد ان ساتش كيس. طيب واضح ان كوفيد 19 مؤثر جدا على الكويستشنز النهارده. Can we consider the COVID-19 a basis for claiming additional costs incurred for the safety precautions needed to proceed with the works under the variation clause? Can I answer this uh, question? Um, yes. Go ahead. Uh, I, actually, Anna, I don't know is it, is, if you all know, but uh, FIDIC had held a series of webinars on COVID-19 uh, in the past maybe a month and a half or two months. Uh, one of those webinars had the same, يعني, I would say, one of the FIDIC uh, guys in the FIDIC uh, task group and uh, actually mentioned what I'm going to tell you is that this should be addressed as a variation to the contract. It's not a, it's not a claim. It's not تحت force majeure or حاجة زي كده. This is purely a variation because the contractor uh, is now purchasing more safety, safety gear, say, protective equipment that were not uh, anticipated at the time of signing the contract. فبالتالي, uh, this purchase of additional materials, uh, a contractor should just request a variation. يعني بأفريشن ذا ذا الإكويبمنت ذات إز 
provided in the contract. Uh, to my surprise, Saraha, in a lot of contractors, uh, from my experience at least, I never, I've never seen a request for a variation on this statement. Contractors, yet tagi who to COVID uh, force majeure or haga zakida, but we the contractors should use the variations clause in this uh, in this uh, case, in my opinion. Great. Okay. Okay, we'll take this last question. Uh, the meaning of impossibility of per performance, it means that the contractor cannot perform the obligation he, he is liable for under the contract, meaning that he cannot complete the project within the agreed time for completion, not, as he, not that he's not capable of working at all. Okay, I'll direct this question to Dr. Wayne. Uh Actually, I like this interpretation and actually I agree with it that um, the impossibility of performance, it doesn't necessarily mean that I will not be able to work at all, but it will be impossible to complete the project on time. Uh, however, uh, this will not lead to termination of the contract. It will lead to an extension of time maybe. So yes, it's, 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 a, it's a right interpretation of the word impossibility and I agree with it. Uh, however, um, when the law in Article 159 sa said in case of impossibility of uh, execution, the contract will be rescinded ipso facto, the, 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 the law, I, I believe, meant that, uh, or the, 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 uh, meant that there is an impossibility to execute anything. So the project cannot be completed. But I like your interpretation. If I may add something as well, um, I think one important factor to consider is the duration of the impossibility. So for example, if it's impossible to perform for one week, it's different than if it's impossible to perform for five months. So, and that's why in a lot of consultancy contracts, for example, uh, you have a duration for the force, actually for the force majeure clause. It says if the force majeure clause uh, is, uh, takes an effect for more than six months, for example, then the contract is terminated. Um, but of course, if, if, if the, uh, and of course in the FIDIC we have uh, the prolonged suspension, which also can result in a termination. You can say it's like, it has a termination effect. However, if there's a, a impossibility of performance or a prevention of the performance for a period of one week to an activity that is on the critical path of the project, then in that case, uh, I think that the act of, it's, it's a prevention, it's an impossibility. However, as Dr. Ahmed mentions, um, it can lead to a time extension. Whether it's compensable or not depends on uh, the contract of the FIDIC clause. As you know, that in the force majeure clause of the FIDIC, the, the circumstances of force majeure are divided into uh, man-made factors and natural factors. So if it's a natural, uh, natural factor, such as a flood or an earthquake, and so on and so forth, then in that case, it's a time only and no cost. If it's a man-made factor, then it's a uh, cost. And of course, this touches at COVID-19 and, and an interesting, if you're, if you're into conspiracy theories, if uh, COVID-19 is, is a bio, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's an attack and it's, a, it's something that is uh, man-made, in that case, there would be uh, time and cost. And if it's uh, just a natural thing, then it's just time and no cost. And actually, oh. Dr. Walid, that the, as you said, there is the optional termination uh, clause in the FIDIC if the the, there is a prolonged, um, a prolonged effect of a pandemic, then a party may uh, refer to the optional termination and may terminate. So as you said, it has to do with the duration of, uh, of the effect or the, 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 how long the effect is. Okay, I would like to thank Dr. Wally and Dr. Walid for the interesting discussion. Very good food for, with food for thought. And dear respectful ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attention and for such interactive discussion and comments. Uh, looking forward to seeing you in uh, future webinars and goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This webinar was excellent. Yes, thank you for the excellent moderation, Dr. Salo. Thank you very much. And thank you all for thank attending. You.